Good evening and a very warm welcome to the York Consortium for Conservation and Craftsmanship and to the last of our summer series of Second Tuesday Talks. My name is Susie Clark and I'm a paper and photographic materials conservator and I serve on the consortium's committee. We launched this summer series of Second Tuesday Talks following the success of our webinar Conservation and Craft Myths which was held online on the 16th of June in place of our planned AGM. We are pleased to have attracted a wide audience as well as our members to these earlier events and are delighted to welcome many non-members again tonight. So I hope that our regular participants will forgive me for saying just a few words about the consortium by way of introduction. The consortium was established 20 years ago in recognition of York's central role as a hub for conservation and craft skills within the heritage sector. We've built upon this to emphasise the close integration between craftspeople and conservators and to provide a point of focus for both practitioners and those interested in supporting our heritage. The Foundation's annual bursary scheme has also flourished and we have awarded over 250 bursaries to support the development of craft and conservation skills. I'm delighted to welcome our speaker this evening, Dr. Helen Rawson. Hello, Helen. Hello. Uh, Helen took up the post as Head of Heritage at York Minster in March 2020. She has spent much of her career in the Scottish museum sector, including 19 years in the museum service of the University of Andrew, St Andrews first as curator and later as co-director. There she played a leading role in establishing MUSA, the Museum of the University of St Andrews. Helen has also worked as a museum consultant in research development and at National Museum Scotland. She is an associate of the Museums Association and a member of the Recognition Committee, Museums uh, Galleries Scotland. Helen's research interests, including her PhD, also focus on the history and development of museum collections. Tonight, Helen will be talking about a temporary exhibition, The Heart of Yorkshire, Creativity and Culture in York Minster's Collections, which will be opening this month in York Minster's Chapter House. Helen will discuss the objects and their history and explore the considerations, challenges, and opportunities of putting together an exhibition in an unmuseum space. Following Helen's presentation, Helen will be joined by her co-curators, Peter Young and Sarah Griffin, for a discussion session. Peter is York Minster's archivist. Hello, Peter. Hello. And Sarah is York Minster's librarian. Hello, Sarah. Hello. It's great to have you all with us. And now I'm pleased to welcome Helen for the main presentation, The Heart of Yorkshire, Creativity and Culture in York Minster's Collections. Thank you for inviting me to speak to the York Consortium for Conservation and Craftsmanship. This is the first presentation that I've given over Zoom, so I hope that you will forgive any minor glitches. I'm speaking tonight about a new exhibition in the Chapter House of York Minster, Titled The Heart of Yorkshire, Creativity and Culture in York Minster's Collections. The exhibition will open on Saturday the 19th of September and run until Sunday the 17th of January. The exhibition features items from the Minster's museum, library and archive collections, which were either made in York or the surrounding area, or have a long or intrinsic connection with the region. It has been curated by myself as Head of Heritage, with Peter Young, the Minster's archivist, and York Minster librarian, Sarah Griffin, who is also the Rare Books librarian at the University of York. Before I talk more about the exhibition themes and the objects displayed within it, I would like to discuss the reasons for curating it at this particular time. Like so many other institutions, York Minster was forced to close due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Although prayer and worship continued remotely, including through the popular services on Zoom, under government rules, no visitors or worshippers were able to enter the building from the start of lockdown in March until mid-June, when private prayer in the Minster was able to resume. 
services started again on the 4th of July, and sightseers could return from the 11th of July. For reasons of public health and to maintain social distancing, sightseers have to book in advance and numbers are strictly limited. Face masks have to be worn in the building, again in accordance with government guidance. We are so delighted to welcome back worshippers and visitors to the Minster, and a great deal of thought and effort has gone into ensuring that everyone's visit is as safe as possible. This has meant some changes. It presently the Undercroft Museum remains closed. Those of you who know it will be aware that the Undercroft is a relatively constricted space beneath the Minster. There are challenges presented by the rather narrow passageways, some of which you can see on these slides, and by the ventilation of the space, and also the number of hands-on interactives. We are considering that as carefully, and hope that it may ultimately be possible to admit a small number of visitors at the one time, albeit with some adaption to displays and careful monitoring of the pace and flow of people through the space. Likewise, the tower tours are also currently closed, and there are no group guided tours of the Minster to maintain social distancing. Visitors can, however, speak to the extremely knowledgeable visitor experience staff stationed across the Minster floor. We are very conscious that the closure of the Minster was felt keenly by so many, from worshippers and visitors across the world, to staff and local residents, all of whom were affected in so many different ways by the effects of the pandemic. As we know, there have also been serious repercussions to the local, national and global economies. In 2019, York Minster reported its highest ever visitor numbers, welcoming over 706,000 people. Now, like so many organisations, the Minster is facing a huge financial impact due to the coronavirus pandemic, with an expected loss of 5.2 million in income this year. We receive no regular income from the Government or Church of England for the maintenance or running of the Minster, and so do rely on the income we generate from those who visit the Cathedral. Moreover, the economy of York itself relies heavily on tourism, as we all know. Hotels, restaurants, Cafes, shops and businesses large and small depend on the spend of visitors and drawing them back safely into the city is important for economic recovery. The museum, library and archive collections of York Minster have an important role in supporting the cathedral's mission and in enabling visitors of all faiths and none to explore its history and heritage. The displays in the undercroft cover a variety of subjects and two millennia of history, from the Roman site beneath the Minster to medieval masonry techniques, archaeological finds and sculptures, vestments and other ecclesiastical material, some of which is still in use today. Highlights include the famous York Gospels, which have been in York since about 1020 and are still used as an oath book for canons of the Minster, and the Horn of Ulf, an ivory drinking horn dating from about 1030, said to have been presented by Ulfus, son of Thorold, in symbolic title to the lands in West Deer Western Deera, which he was given to the Minster. With the Undercroft currently closed, we are keen to put items from the collections on display elsewhere in the Minster. The Minster is, of course, crammed with spectacular objects. From the magnificent stained glass windows to the fine tombs and monuments and the wonderful great organ which is currently being reinstalled after its recent refurbishment there are no shortage of things to see nevertheless it was felt that a temporary exhibition on a particular subject would increase the visitor offer and the range of material available and enable in-depth engagement with and understanding of the selected items we could simply have located items from the undercroft we decided not to do so for three main reasons. Firstly, we remain optimistic that the Undercroft may at some point be able to reopen safely. Guidance on health and safety in relation to COVID is evolving so rapidly. For example, choral singing will soon be allowed again in the Minster. The Minster's own experience of managing the new guidance and of the behaviour of returning visitors is also growing fast. So far, we've found that people are overwhelmingly understanding and respectful of the rules and of staff and other visitors. Such considerations, among many of the factors inform risk assessments, I think really we're all waiting to see whether autumn will bring a second wave. Secondly, the displays in the Undercroft are designed to tell a coherent narrative within a certain space. For example, the excavation of the Roman camp and the cases and other interpretive elements are specifically designed for that space. It would be difficult and costly to relocate them. Finally, a new temporary exhibition provides a wonderful opportunity to highlight objects usually held in storage and which for conservation and other reasons may be unsuitable for long-term display. 
We also hope that the exhibition may draw in new visitors and attract back those who already know the Minster well. The exhibition has been designed to complement the main theme in the Minster in the period up to Advent, love. As Canon presenter Vicky Johnson has put it, for Christians, love is the first and greatest commandment. We are called to love God with all our heart, mind, soul and strength and love our neighbour. The idea behind the selection of this particular theme in the work and worship of the Minster at this time is to mark and acknowledge the amazing ways in which communities have come together and supported one another during COVID-19 and, from a Christian perspective, to respond to the crisis in which our world finds itself with the commandment to love. As Vicky says, what do we hold on to at these times? Love. How do we build a new world after such a difficult time? Love. How do we acknowledge the past and give thanks for all that is to come? Love. The theme of love will be reflected through worship, music, teaching, and the other activities of the Minster. Love is, of course, many faceted, and in planning the exhibition, we thought about how love and the sense of community and creativity relate to the collections that the Minster has accumulated over many centuries. We also considered the potential audience for the exhibition. With an awareness of what the local community had been through and continues to go through through the COVID-19 pandemic, and a consideration of the travel restrictions and possibly lack of confidence in venturing out that may keep visitors close to home, we decided to focus on material connected to York and Yorkshire and the skills and talent of local people, which has of course had an impact far beyond the city's walls. In selecting the design for the exhibition panels, we were inspired by the West Window, which contains the beautiful heart-shaped tracery now popularly known as the Heart of Yorkshire. Um, so this is uh, based on, the, on that window. Um, the designer is Sally Walker, who does a lot of work for the Minster. Uh, so currently the nave is orientated so that worshippers face that window. This design, we felt, brought together the Minster's themes of love with the, crafts, with the craftsmanship and creativity represented in the exhibition. Creativity has thrived in York throughout the city's existence. Goldsmiths, glaziers and stonemasons, scribes, printers and bookbinders, writers, artists and performers have all contributed to the dynamic cultural life of the city and region. The exhibition highlights a selection of items from York Minster's collections, from stained glass and silver to beautifully illuminated manuscripts, printed books, York's first newspaper and playbills from the Theatre Royal. Since its beginnings in 627, York Minster has commissioned material to support its devotional and educational missions. Manuscripts and books were needed for services and prayers and for sharing knowledge and learning. Fine gold and silver vessels were used for sacred purposes. The magnificent stained glass windows presented scenes from the Bible and the lives of saints, important in an age when many of the congregation could not read or understand the Latin services. The exquisite design and the care taken in making such objects honoured and praised God and reflected his glory. Local history material has come into the Minster's Library, making it an invaluable resource for understanding the city's development. York Minster's Library archives and museum care for this material, preserving it for future generations and making it available to visitors and researchers. The treasure in this exhibition is not only the objects on display, wonderful though they are, it is also the skills, dedication and passion which light the heart of the work of the artists, writers and craftspeople. Today, with the arts and creative industries threatened, like so many of us, by the devastating personal and economic impact of COVID-19, these items are reminders of the vitality and influence of culture and creativity in the region throughout the ages. I will go on to talk about the particular items on display in a moment, but first I would like to discuss some of the practical considerations and challenges in curating it. The chapter house, which is shown here on these slides in, in all its glory, was identified as a possible venue for the exhibition as a large, well-ventilated space, which has already reopened to the public. The chapter house is one of the most spectacular spaces in the Minster. Construction is thought to have begun in the 1280s. There is evidence that the main timbers for the roof were felled in 1288 and the space was in use by 1295. With 44 stalls around the walls, the chapter house was the meeting place of the dean and chapter, where those interested with the care of the cathedral church would come together to administer its affairs. It is still used for the formal ceremony to admit new members of chapter, 
the next actually takes place on Thursday this week. It has an octagonal design, which lends itself well to a one-way system, with cases placed at intervals to allow social distancing between visitors. The stonework and stained glass are endlessly fascinating, and it is impossible not to spot something new on every, on every visit. It is wonderful to be creating an exhibition within such a beautiful space. However, I must admit to a slight concern that the displays will be overshadowed by their surroundings, but I hope that the visitors will gain an appreciation of the religious, architectural and art historical context in which some of the objects featured were created, but may not be as apparent in a more traditional museum gallery. However, there were other challenges to consider in putting on an exhibition in a non-museum space. Objects can be susceptible to environmental damage from light and fluctuations in temperature and humidity. Rapid fluctuations are particularly problematic. The conservators among you know all this already, but to give an example for those who don't work in the field, consider an oil painting on canvas framed in a wooden frame. The object as a whole consists of several different materials, paint, wood, canvas. These have different properties and so, if exposed to sudden environmental change in relative humidity, expand and contract at different rates. In the worst case, in the very worst cases, paintings are known to erupt under such strain. So, when considering whether the chapter house was a suitable venue for an exhibition, we had to consider the environment within it and whether it could be controlled or mitigating measures be put in place. The electric lights within the room cannot be dimmed as would be standard in museum galleries, nor can the large stained glass windows be covered, of course, and UV rays, which are the most damaging, be entirely eliminated. So we thought carefully about where to position the cases within the room and measured the amount of light admitted on sunny and cloudy days. This was between 70 and 110 lux. 50 lux would have been ideal for works on paper, books and manuscripts. But as light damage is cumulative, we can reduce exposure to it by turning the pages at regular intervals and choosing not to redisplay the works, particularly at those pages, uh, again for some time. This is, of course, the advantage of a temporary rather than long term exhibition in terms of conservation considerations. Likewise, relative humidity was found to fluctuate in the chapter house. You'll see on the chart at the top of the slide, it goes from about 56% to 80%, although temperature, which is the red line, is relatively stable, uh, relative humidity is the blue line. Um, however, well-sealed museum cases can act as buffers to environmental changes, and silica gel placed within them can act as a control, stabilising humidity. We put a case in the chapter house for a few weeks as a trial run and found that the temperature stabilised at 18 to 20 degrees centigrade and relative humidity stabilised at about 60%. You can see that on the chart at the bottom of the slide, which is very slightly higher than the ideal, as 60% is the recommended upper level. But importantly, it wasn't showing any major fluctuations, which is what really causes damage. And um, so considering what we were up against in terms of relative humidity fluctuations, I was really impressed with the way the, the case performed. Um, I would be really reluctant to put permanent displays on in that space um, with items exhibited there for many months or years. But for a short term temporary exhibition for a particular purpose, it was feasible. Another particular challenge for me personally is that I don't yet know the collections very well. I took up post as Head of Heritage on the 16th of March, just ahead of lockdown. Delivering uh, an exhibition so early into a new role would probably have been a fairly big challenge for any curator, but it was compounded by the fact that I was of necessity largely working from home and unable to see the collections very often, and that many of my colleagues, including the Heritage Assistant and the Heritage Interpretation Officer, are furloughed. Thankfully, I had access to the electronic catalogue records, the research files on the server, electronic publications through the University of York Library, and most importantly of all, the knowledge and expertise of my wonderful co-curators, librarian Sarah Griffin and archivist Peter Young, both of whom have worked at the Minster for many years. Curating the exhibition with them was a fantastic opportunity for me to get to know the collections better. I'm particularly delighted that they are here for the live Q&A tonight because I fully intend to divert all awkward questions to them. On a serious note, they have a huge depth of knowledge of all the collections and have been incredibly welcoming and generous in sharing it. And I would also like to acknowledge the support of Sarah Brown and Nick Teed of York Glaciers Trust, Alex Carberry, the head verger at Minster, and Dr John Goff of the Minster's Fabric Advisory Committee. So, to talk about the contents of the exhibition. 
one of the most striking features of the Minster is its stained glass. The Minster contains the largest and most diverse collection of medieval stained glass in Britain, with the earliest panels dating back almost 900 years. From masterpieces of the Middle Ages to more recent designs, the colour, light and brilliance of the windows illuminate the Minster and inspire people as they have since their creation. York was an important centre of glass painting in the Middle Ages. Surviving records, including contracts, reveal details about the glazing of the Minster's windows. For example, we know that the West Window, which contains the heart of Yorkshire tracery that features on these exhibition panels, was commissioned by Archbishop William Melton in about 1339, and that its glazier Robert, probably Robert Kettlebarn, a freeman of the city, was paid 12 pence per foot per foot for coloured glass and sixpence for white. The celebrated rose window was designed in the late 1400s, probably by the Petties, a family firm of glaciers in York for nearly a century. Master glazier John Thornton was brought to the city from his native Coventry to create the spectacular Great East Window of 1405-08. Though the Minster is of course most famous for its medieval glass, it also contains stained glass from other periods up to the present, including fine works by the 18th century enamel glass painter William Peckett of York. Over the centuries, Changes have been made to the glazing of some of the York, Min some of York Minster's windows. Reasons for this include building work to extend or develop the Minster, damage, the commissioning of new pieces, and changes in style and taste. Various panels have been displaced and are held in storage. And the exhibition features a selection of these displaced panels from different periods of Minster's history. So on the screen here, you can see a foliate border panel uh, from the 12th century. This is one of the oldest pieces of stained glass in the Minster and indeed in Europe. The brilliant colours of the leaves and the foliage would once have bordered a larger scene. It is thought to have been commissioned in the 1160s under Archbishop Roger of pont le to bring the latest French influence styles to the 11th century nave. Another panel shown in the exhibition, but unfortunately, which I don't have an image of, is a composite panel um, featuring an angel musician. It's actually made up of 33 fragments of medieval glass from perhaps 18 different windows. The largest piece shows a curly haired angel with peacock wings who plays a drum. It really is a lovely piece. The panel was put together in the 1950s from pieces of loose glass under Dean Milner White to fill a space in a navile window. It was removed in 1973 when a modern commemorative coat of arms replaced it. Although historically it's not unusual for glass to have been reused in this way, today conservators tend to take a more considered approach. Uh, here we have a heraldic uh, crest with a stag dating from the late 17th century. This fragment of glass shows the head and upper body of a stag wearing a chained collar, the colours of which probably relate to the Clifford family. The background of plumes and the stag's posture with one foreleg raised suggests that it was a heraldic supporter originally shown to the right of the coat of arms and balanced by another animal on the left side. The style and technique of the glass painting, which uses enamel paint made from ground glass, dated to the late 17th century. It was possibly created by Henry Giles, a York glass painter well known for his heraldic designs. You can also see on the slide here um, a bird pecking fruit, uh, the design dating from about 1860 to 80. So this 19th century design was inspired by 15th century bird quarries of the sort that can be found in the Minister Seuss Chapel. This example is probably by J.W. Knowles, York's most eminent Victorian glass painter, whose workshop was on Stonegate. His notes and photographs of the Minster's windows in this period are an important resource for researchers. The exhibition also features some beautiful illuminated manuscripts. Private devotion, such as reading and praying alone, has always been an important part of Christian life. For centuries, the book most often used in private devotion was the Psalter, which contains the Book of Psalms, a series of religious poems from the Old Testament of the Bible. Not only members of the clergy and religious orders, but also lay people, that is ordinary people not in religious orders, recited the Psalms as part of their devotions. Displayed in this exhibition is a Psalter created in the mid 12th century and now known as the Byland Psalter because it was owned by the monks of Byland Abbey in Yorkshire in the 1500s. Written in Latin, 
The Psalms are divided into sections to help the reader find the appropriate ones for recitation during a service or in private devotion. The first psalm in each section has a large initial letter, while a marginal gloss provides a running commentary containing interpretations of the individual psalms. From the 8th century, Christians also used other kinds of private devotional books. Books of Hours, which first appeared in the mid-1200s, quickly grew popular and became best-selling books among wealthy lay people for the next 250 years. At the heart of the Book of Hours is a series of eight sets of psalms, hymns, prayers and other texts in honour of Jesus Christ's mother, the Blessed Virgin Mary. They were recited at specific times during the day and are therefore known as the Hours of the Virgin. Before the invention of the printing press, books had to be produced by hand and were expensive. For those who could afford it, books of hours could be customised to suit their devotional requirements and taste. They could decide which of the texts were included in the book and how it was decorated. Among those on display in this exhibition is the Bolton Hours, once thought to have been written for John Bolton, a merchant alderman and mercer of York, who died in 1445. Lately, it's been argued that the patron may in fact have been Margaret Blackburn, the mother of Alice Bolton. There are 47 full page pictures of saints and biblical scenes and six smaller miniatures. The exhibition also features works used in public services. From early Christian times, the rituals of worship developed along regional lines. By the 9th century, the forms and practice of worship in Rome as a major centre of Christianity had gradually spread across Western Europe, with local variations arising in dispersed communities. From perhaps as early as 1090, one variation developed at York Minster. It was known as the Use of York and was followed in churches in Northern England for around 450 years. Priests needed a range of service books to assist them with worship. Before the invention of the printing press in the mid 15th century, these were manuscripts written and decorated by hand. The similarities in the decoration of the surviving manuscript books of the use of York suggest that they made, that may have been made in one place, almost certainly York, where there are records of scribes, illuminators and bookbinders from the 1270s onwards. Printed editions of several York use service books were also produced in the city between about uh, 1510 and 1515. And you can see a couple of them here. Uh, this one's particularly lovely with, with the illumination. Together with England's other regional variations, the use of York came to an end during the religious reforms of the 16th century. After the Reformation, the government introduced the Book of Common Prayer in 1549, which had to be used throughout the country. York Minster did not keep any of its Yorkie service books, but a small number survive, and since the 1700s, the Minster and its library have been actively collecting these, uh, so several are featured in the exhibition. As well as service books, churches needed vessels for sacred purposes, such as chalices for the celebration of the Mass. Indeed, gold and silver have been used throughout history in religious ceremonies and for prestigious occasions. Both are of high value and relatively rare, Gold is the more expensive, which is why silver was frequently gilded, covered with a thin layer of gold, to give it the appearance of the costlier metal. Both had to undergo rigorous assaying and testing to ensure their quality as they were used in coins. The metals have therefore become associated with purity, status and honour, making them appropriate for sacred and ceremonial use and for conspicuous display in domestic settings. Silver and gold have a particular beauty, in a dimly lit church, gold and silver vessels would have gleamed and reflected the candlelight and been visible to the congregation at a distance in the celebration of the mass and other rituals. Carried in a solemn procession as rods of office such as croziers or maces, items made from these precious metals would have commanded attention. While arranged within a home as ornaments or exquisite tableware, they demonstrated the taste and wealth of the owner. The York goldsmiths who handled both gold and silver formed themselves into a craft guild in the 14th century. The metals had been worked with in the city from at least the 8th century when mints for issuing coins were established. The system of hallmarks, which developed over time, records the date, maker, standard, that is the quality, and the place of testing of an object. The earliest York mark is a uh, York assay mark, is a leopard's head and a fleur de lis. The closure of the York Assay Office in 1858 ended local hallmarking, but manufacture and repair had continued locally. 
So in the collections of York Minster, as you would expect, we hold many ecclesiastical pieces, some of which remain in active use. We also have some pieces discovered during building work and archaeological investigations, including grave boots. In 1969, engineering work was required to stabilise the foundations of the central tower of York Minster. This very urgent work necessitated the movement of a 13th century tomb after it was reinstated, the identity of which was debated at the time and since, but which recent work by Stuart Harrison, the Minster's archaeologist, was shown to be that of Archbishop Sewell, Sewell de Beauville, who died in 1258. It contained grave goods, including a ring, a pastoral staff, and the chalice and pattern shown here. The chalice and pattern are used during the service of Mass or Holy Communion for the bread and the wine. A chalice and pattern were also found within the tomb of Archbishop Belton when that was opened in 1732. Another unusual piece in the collections is this chalice given to York Minster in 1919 in memory of C.L. Bentley, who was killed in action in France during the First World War. Bentley was a member of the 2nd Battalion of the Manchester, 2nd Battalion Manchester Regiment. The chalice was presented by his mother, sister and brothers, dating from 1568 and made in York. It was perhaps a treasured family heirloom that had come down through the generations. Perhaps surprisingly, the Minster also holds a significant collection of secular and domestic silver. This was developed by William Lee, who collected examples of early or rare York silver. He acquired his first piece at auction in London in 1944 and built up an important collection over the next 30 years. This was exhibited in the Undercroft of York Minster from 1972 and later donated to the Minster. The collection provides important evidence of the history and manufacture of silver in York and of the styles popular in different periods. Several pieces are displayed in the exhibition, including this wine cup on the screen, um, dating from 1655 by Robert Williamson, and um, these were all made in York. Um, also on this slide is a chafing dish by H. Prince and Co. Um, from 1802. The shallow compartment was filled with water to keep um, food warm at the table, hot water, obviously. Um, and here's a pair of sauce boats by Bob and Whitwell, uh, made in York in 1820. And the dolphin's head, which you can maybe just see, is an unusual feature on the handle now. So, um, moving on from silver, the Minster's Library has long been a repository for material relating to the city's history and development. Its holdings include over 3,000 playbills, of which this is one on the screen, uh, which provide important insights into the literary, theatrical and social aspects of the city's past. Drama has of course been an important part of York life since at least medieval times. The best known example is the York Mystery Plays, in which the different guilds performed Bible stories from the back of wagons. York drama found a permanent home when the Theatre Royal was built in the mid-18th century, and watching plays became a part of the social realm that included going to the races and attending balls at the assembly rooms. Plays needed advertising, and this was done through posters pasted up outside the theatre and in shops. These playbills give the names of the actors and tell us a great deal about which plays and authors were popular. They also reveal information about the day-to-day -day running of the theatre, including prices and the practice of sending servants to hold seats. The theatre provided opportunities for those who might not have them in other walks of life. Women played great roles such as Hamlet and wrote some of the most successful plays staged in the 18th century. There was also the opportunity to comment on social issues of the day. Plays like Afrobens or Anoka, Afroben was a woman of course, and Obi or the history of three-fingered Jack with their anti-slavery and anti-colonialism themes were popular. As it is today, the stage could be an arena for writers and actors to speak out against injustices such as the slave trade. This playbill from 1786 promotes Shakespeare's Macbeth with the famous actress Sarah Siddons playing Lady Macbeth. She obviously gets top billing. As you might expect, the history of printing is also well represented in York Minster's library collections. Printing has a long and illustrious history in York, from Frederick Fries, a bookbinder and stationer 600 years ago, to the Sessions family still producing books in the 21st century, a diverse range of material has been produced. Among the printers were three inspiring and entrepreneurial women, Alice Broad, Grace White and Anne Ward, 
who were highlighted in the exhibition. Innovative and creative, they operated in a male-dominated industry and excelled at it. All three took over their husband's printing presses when they were made widows. For a while, Alice Broad, who was active 1661 to 1680, was the only printer in the city. Working with the young family, she negotiated the complex political situation following the restoration of Charles II and set up new business relationships with the church and with civic partners. Later, her daughter Hannah married another printer, John White, with whom Alice Broad co-published before transferring the press to him. The future of her family and her business assured. Grace White, who was active 1716 to 1721, produced York's first newspaper, shown here, the York Mercury. This was the, the first page, the first edition. And where she led, others followed. Printers across the city began to produce their own papers until York posted eight different titles. Anne Ward, who was active 1759 to 1789, printed the first edition of Tristram Shandy, Florence Stern's epic novel, and became known as the most reliable printer in York. She had a printing shop on Coney Street overlooking the river and described her own approach to business as diligent and impartial, or with useful skills. The period when these three women were working saw an explosion of books printed in the North, for the North, and most of their output reflected this movement. So, in conclusion, the exhibition has been curated to showcase some of these amazing objects, to celebrate the artistry and craftsmanship of the city in the city over the centuries, and to explore the role of the cathedral at the heart of this rich and inspiring culture. I hope that you will come along to see it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Helen. That was uh, very enjoyable and um, very, very interesting. Um, I'm only just back because my internet cut out, so I missed a bit of it, but um, I'm sure it was, all of it was very good. Um, we'll now have a, a conversation session where audience questions will be discussed by the panel. Please send any questions in using the Q&A box which should appear at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So uh, we are joined by Peter Young, York Minster Archivist, and Sarah Griffin, York Minster Librarian. Um, Peter, perhaps could you explain your role briefly? Um, Certainly. Yes, yeah, so, so my role involves looking after the archives of the chapter of York, that's the, the governing body of the Minster, and, and those archives date back to about 1150. I also look after the Minster's manuscript collections, date back to about the year 1000. The photographic collections too, which include many images on, on glass from the early days of photography uh, in the mid-19th century. And also archives of, of related organisations, uh, including Called the Glazier's Trust that relate to their work on the on the Minster. Um, I work too with colleagues uh, across the Minster to ensure that records they're creating today are kept for as long as they're needed for, for legal and reference purposes. The records of historical value are kept permanently as part of the as part of the archives. Um, tying in with that, I'm also the Chief's Data Protection Officer. Okay, thank you, Peter. And um, Sarah, perhaps you could clarify your role a bit as the librarian, what your responsibilities are? Yes, of course. Well, I'm lucky enough to curate the largest cathedral library in England, and it has much of what you'd expect, very good um, theological collection, lots of theological material, but it also has material that perhaps is a bit unexpected. So, for instance, we have a good collection of early printed medical books. We have some really lovely hand-coloured atlases, including the first atlas ever printed. And we have a significant local history collection. And that's significant in terms of numbers and in coverage. And it's that collection that I've drawn on for the exhibition. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, well, we'll go to our questions now. And the first question is from Hilary Moxon. And in essence, it's one of the most important documents in the Minster archives 
is James Torres, uh, Antiquities of York Minster, or James Torres, sorry, Antiquities of York Minster, 1690 to 91. Uh, she asks, are there plans to digitize it to provide easier research access? So I don't know who wants to take this one. <laughs> I'll, I'll take that one. And actually, before I answer that question from Hillary, I would like to point out a completely undeliberate mistake. I wasn't testing you all, but before I get lots of questions on it, in the presentation, I clicked onto the Ives Breviary on the PowerPoint while talking about printed books, and you'll have all have spotted instantly. It wasn't a printed book, it was a manuscript. So I should have clicked onto that slide a bit quicker. But in answer to Hillary's question, for those who don't know, uh, James Tor's Antiquities of York Minster, um, which was uh, which dates from 1690 to 91, uh, is a very important volume. James Tor was an antiquarian who conducted important research into churches and church history in York, and he also copied medieval documents, some of which were later lost. So, ensuring that a record um, of their contents survives to this day. He provided very detailed descriptions of York Minster, including its stained glass and monuments, which are such an invaluable uh, resource for researchers. And I'm delighted to say that we are working to digitise that, um, that volume. Nick Teed of the Glaciers Trust is actually in the Minster this week, creating a photographic record of it. And in time, that will be made available online. That, that part will take quite a bit longer, um, but it's such an important project. So I'm, I'm delighted that we're taking that forward at this time. Okay, well, thank you very much. That sounded a very appropriate question at this moment. So uh, our next question is, will there be any examples of embroidery in the exhibition? And if so, how will they be displayed? The quick answer is no, <laughs> sadly. <laughs> Embroidery is one of the things that don't feature, um, but we, we do have really lovely examples of the embroiderer's work and earlier work um, actually displayed throughout the Minster, including in the Lady Chapel. So if you do come into the Minster, do, do go around uh, the other areas and you can see it there. Okay, right. Um, I'm just looking to see if we've got any more questions. Um, can't see any at the moment. Perhaps you could answer the question about when the exhibition is uh, open, what the opening hours are. Yes, so at the moment York Minster's um, open on a slightly different pattern to what you might have been used to historically. Uh, we're at Monday to Thursday 11 till 4.30, Friday and Saturday 10 till 4.30 and Sunday for sightseers 12.30 uh, to 2.30. The crucial thing is to check the website because with the impact of the COVID pandemic that does change from time to time. We're actually increasing the opening hours gradually and also you do have to book in advance to visit so please make sure that you, you do that. Right okay well thank you for making it easier for people. Um, we have another question from Oliver Corot. Thank you for your presentation. Congratulations on realising and curating an exhibition in such challenging circumstances. Um, I'm interested in any specific new thinking about communicating, engaging narratives to visitors in these times. How did you think about who your audience would be and also their requirements or expectations? Um, just to bring my colleagues in, Sarah, do you have any thoughts on that one? Well, I think that we were going back to what Helen said at the beginning, that we were going to be catering for um, an audience who probably were more local than normal. You know, people aren't traveling around a lot yet. And we really wanted to do something for, for the local community and to think about what might, what might make them proud, what might engage them. And we thought, well, if we looked at all the fantastic things that have come out of York um, for so many years and still are, you know, there's still fantastic creativity in York. And we wanted to think about different things, things that aren't always on display and aren't always maybe so obvious treasures. Mm. Yes, I have a question of my own, if I may ask it. Um, 
I wondered whether you felt that you'd brought some things to attention which really haven't been seen before, whether there are some really unknown treasures that you've brought out in this exhibition or, or whether there's anything that you particularly like to draw anybody's attention to um, that really, as I say, hasn't been viewed before. I think that might be a question for my colleagues again, because with being so new in post, I'm not quite sure what has been exhibited. Peter, would you like to take that one? Yes, well, I think that there's some material in there that has received a lot of scholarly attention, like the Bolton Book of Hours, the Pavement Book of Hours, which are very uh, beautiful things of historical interest that, that locals might not be aware of. So it's a, it's a good opportunity to, to draw attention and to a wider audience of those those kinds of things. Okay. Um, we've also got one here from Martin Stancliffe. Um, what was the most challenging conservation issue that you faced in preparing the exhibition? I think it really was the conditions in the chapter house because it's it's such a large space with such a high ceiling um, and the stained glass obviously lets um, different levels of light in and so on, depending on, on the kind of weather we're having outside. So for us, it was thinking through, can we make this space work in terms of what we're trying to do? And thankfully, because the cases um, are such a wonderful construction, the professional museum cases, which are usually in the old palace, it is possible, um, but it, it needed a lot of thinking through and also thinking about security and the staffing of the exhibition um, because we want to make sure that visitors have a very engaging experience, but we also have to think about social distancing and one way systems around the exhibition and so on. Um, so it, it brought a lot of um, challenges together, but we're installing it next week. So we hope we've succeeded. No, oh, good, good. Um, another question um, from James Grierson. Does the Minster lend items from its collection? Whoops, it vanished then, sorry. <laughs> it shot down my screen. Um, hold on. Um, sorry about this, I'm just finding it again. Um, does the Minster lend items from its collection to other museums? Yes, we do, absolutely. <laughs> And we're very happy to. Um, we do ask for um, good notice of any exhibitions that are coming up, but there's there's lots of examples to loans within the city of York itself, York Museums Trust and so on, and further afield. So we're always glad to be approached. Okay. Um, now another question. This temporary exhibition has been forced upon you by difficult circumstances, but will it be part of a programme of temporary displays going forwards? Peter, do you want to say anything about our temporary exhibition programmes? Well, I think it's been a good opportunity to explore, start thinking about what themes we'd like to explore um, in, the, in the future. And I suppose, depending on how the situation pans out with COVID-19, it, well, it could well be that there will be more temporary exhibitions. Um, so, I think we'll be continuing to think about other things that we can that we can possibly bring out uh, in in those future ex in those future exhibitions. And we should stress that we do have a temporary exhibition space um, in the treasury, which is linked to the Undercroft. So the displays down there do change as well. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, we have another question here from Beth and Griffiths. With such a selective exhibition and a team selecting pieces, how easy is it to agree on which piece? Um, any examples of how you chose one piece over another? Sarah, do you want to take that? Well, actually, it, we were really lucky because there were six cases. So that was, okay, let's, let's have two cases each. And so we, obviously, you know, I'm a library, person, Peter's an archivist, Helen's a museum person. So although we work together very closely, we do have our own disciplines. So we each chose what we wanted to show. And then we had a big sort of show and tell for each other. And I think we pretty much agreed. I can't think of anything that, that you know, the other two went, oh, no. I think, it, I think you know, we, we got on pretty well doing it. 
okay, I think great. Sorry, go um, on, Peter. Sorry, Susan, I was on. just going to add that um, what we've done two cases each there is there is some cross contamination in the cases so they're not just you know strictly manuscripts case you have got different media in the in the same case so we linked up in that bit as well okay um we have another question from susan rathmel what a wonderful range of objects is the exhibition likely to travel outside the city well, I think like all museums at the current time, we're finding that um, that kind of planning is really difficult just now. Um, so at the moment, there are no plans for it to tour. And I think there's been so much disruption to so many other institutions programmes. Um, I was talking to other curators just recently that people are looking in house for their own displays just now because we're not quite sure what's around the corner. So sadly, no, it will just be based in York. So please come and see it in the city itself. <laughs> um, we've also got one. Do you have a favourite object in the exhibition? Well, there is um, a fantastic missile. It's a printed missile that actually, you're quite right. You know, I said we had the two cases each, but I managed to sneak some library books into um, Peter's archive cases. So, and there's a wonderful missile that um, is York use, but uh, after the Reformation, somebody has taken a knife and has slashed straight through the, the crucifixion. And it's just such a dramatic object. And it's, you know, it's history in action. It's the Reformation in action. And I particularly love that one. Mm. And perhaps Peter and Helen, you both like to ask that, answer that question. What about Peter first? Well, I'd rather like the the Byland Psalter. It's a, you know, it's a relatively early manuscript amongst our collections, with a obviously a local connection. Something that well, this particular Psalter was used um, privately rather than in a um, in a liturgical way as a commentary um, in the in the margins. Um, but I think just the Psalter as a um, as a as a concept, um, the fact that it's 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 at the centre of Christian worship in terms of it being used both as the basis of um, the divine office, the regular round of services in the in the church and also as um, a central part of private devotion from, from early on um, in the history of Christianity. It's quite a, a powerful object. And for me, it was the silver. I was really spoilt for choice in selecting the silver for the exhibition. Um, we've got such wonderful pieces, both that have come down through the Minster's history, such as the chalices and patterns that I showed on the slides, and also from the William Lee collection. So I spent a very happy day in the silver store with Alex Carberry, the head verger, and it was such a difficulty to select the pieces for the case because I would have put in 50 more if I could have done. Okay, uh, well, I'm sure you were spoilt for choice, really. <laughs> um, given the, another question here, given the current financial challenges, are there grants available to support the Minster's work with the collections? Yes, I, I think um, we are fortunate that so many um, major funding bodies have stepped forward to make grants available during this time of crisis to the heritage sector as a whole. The exhibition itself has benefited from grants from Museum Development Yorkshire and for the Heritage Emergency Fund through the lottery, which covered the cost of um, uh, the kind of printing and so on of, of labels and display panels, but also the cost of the visitor services staff to staff the exhibition, because of course, um, for visitor engagement and for security, we need people to be in the chapter house while the exhibition's on. So we're really pleased that we've been able to draw on that and um, to make this available to everybody. Mm. Oh, well, that's good to hear that practical funding filtered through. <laughs> um, we have another question here um, from Jim Spriggs. Are you displaying any object? Yes, are you displaying any objects outside any of the cases, such as sculpture, for example? 
And um, no, well, as I say, the, the chapter house itself has wonderful carvings and it's got the stained glass and so on. But no, we're not having any objects that aren't already part of the chapter house on open display. And actually part of the reason behind that is that um, we need to consider security, but also we need to consider people touching things. I think people are always very drawn to objects on open display. And in normal times, museums think about that carefully and make accessible things um, that if they can be touched, that's made clear. Just now, that kind of handling is so difficult with COVID that no, everything is, is behind glass in cases, unfortunately. Um, but there might be the opportunity in the future. Okay, thank you. Um, I think another question is just coming through. Um, let me just see that. <laughs> Sorry, we're being deluged with uh, questions here. Um, is digitisation a priority for visitor experience in the current circumstances? Do you want to take that one, Peter? Oh yes, I mean this is um, something we've been, been giving thought to whether, for instance, or um, our exhibitions that we that we create rather than just being taken down um, could have a could have a digital element perhaps from the start of the exhibition but also continuing to exist as a as an archive um, going forward something that would be available online so it's certainly something that's that's in our minds and we're thinking about how we might be able to develop an infrastructure to that. Okay, well thank you very much for that. Um, well we've got um, a final question here. In the current circumstances is it possible to access the manuscripts you've discussed for research purposes? What is the procedure for this? Sarah, do you want to take that? Yes, certainly. Well we're working very hard at the moment to reopen the old palace for researchers. At the moment, it's it's not open, and we we are not going to open before the end of this month. The what we need to do is make sure that the space is safe for visitors and for staff. So staff are back in, and we're working hard to, you know, reconfigure the space. The information for that is going to be on the website, but it isn't there yet. At the moment, we're still preparing it. So what I suggest is that you keep an eye on um, the Minster website and the information will be there as soon as possible. But we're really, really looking forward to welcoming people back to the Old Palace. We have missed you loads. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you all. I think that's, um, we're now at eight o'clock. So I think that was our final question. Um, so that's all we've got time for tonight. But I'd like to thank Helen for a wonderful presentation. And thanks also to Sarah and Peter for joining us for the discussion session. And thank you all for watching and participating tonight. I hope that you've all enjoyed the talk. When the Zoom screen closes, you'll be asked to participate in a short feedback survey. I'm sure you're all saying, oh no, but um, we do appreciate that everyone's bombarded with surveys these days, but please do take the time to complete it. It's um, incredibly helpful to us and we'll use your feedback to guide future events. We'd also like to take the opportunity to invite NUN members to join us as members and we welcome supporters as well as practitioner members. You can sign up via our website where you will also find more details about the benefits of membership. And finally, there won't be a second Tuesday talk in October as we'll be planning our winter series, which will begin in November. And we're also hoping to have an AGM sort of later on in the autumn. We welcome suggestions for topics you'd like to see. So please do get in touch. And finally, thanks again to all our panellists and thank you all for watching and have a good night.